This is the Georgia Farm Monitor. Since 1966, your source for state and national agribusiness news and features for farmers and consumers about Georgia's number one industry, agriculture. The Georgia Farm Monitor is produced by the state's largest general farm organization, the Georgia Farm Bureau. Now, here are your hosts, Ray D'Alessio and Kenny Bergamy. Hi everyone, welcome to another edition of the Georgia Farm Monitor. I'm Kenny Bergamy. Ray D'Alessio is on assignment this week. As always, we've got a great show for you today. Coming up, you can smell the blueberry pies baking already. Now straight ahead, we'll head to Alma, Georgia and see how this year's crop is shaping up. Also on the program, why this internship for UGA students is being called one of the best the SEC has to offer and the role that Delta Airlines plays in it. And then later, are you wanting more deer on your property? Or maybe you had an abundance of deer at one point and they're no longer coming back. Ranger Nick gets some advice from one of the leading organizations in the country on this subject. That's the Quality Deer Management Association. All this and more starting right now on the Georgia Farm Monitor. Of course, blueberries, one of the healthiest foods you can eat. And Georgia is one of the top blueberry producing states in the nation. Every year, millions of pounds of blueberries are produced in the state, and a large percentage are grown in and around Alma. Recently, the Monitor's Mark Wildman traveled to Bacon County to get a look at this year's crop. On his farm in Alma, Georgia Farm Bureau State Board member and Bacon County Farm Bureau President David Lee looks over a blueberry crop that has had a few challenges this year. This field here got a heavy thunderstorm and wind and some hail. And it damaged some of them, but 99% uh, uh, of the fruit's good. It's that 1% that you have to, like everything else, that 1% uh, is what you fight with all the time with soft fruit or leaking fruit or whatever. But basically, it's been a pretty good crop. The average consumer will never see that 1% that is not perfect, but what they will see are large berries in the store that are one of the healthiest foods you can eat. Well, most all your stores now would have Georgia blueberries, they might have a uh, Nature Rock label on them, and they might have Sunny Ridge label on them, they might have, uh, you know, North Bay, and you know, a lot of the, most all the companies has got Georgia blueberries right now. It's in Florida, some of the Florida fruits are, are beginning to wind down, so, so uh, it's mostly Georgia right in the market right now. This crop is very labor intensive. Most berries have to be hand-picked, and labor is very expensive. But some berries can be picked by machine, and growers hope that in the future, more of the crop can be machine harvested. With the technology that we went to the moon and back, and you know, some stuff that we've done technologically, you know, it's just strange that these hands can pick a berry as good as, better than our machines can do. So we really need some machinery to pick quality fruit, and do a good job. And that's a challenge for our equipment folks, our plant breeders and everything. And I think we're headed in that direction because labor's getting to be tougher and tougher. And Blueberry fields are everywhere in Southeast Georgia. And not only will consumers get the benefit of buying fresh berries in the summertime, but don't forget about buying them later on in the year around the holidays. Your frozen product coming out of, a lot of it does come out of Georgia and it's the IQF product and it is great. It looks like marbles when you roll them out of the package and uh, they taste great, a superior tasting than what you'll get on the fresh side of it. So try, if you haven't tried any, and any recipe, uh, it takes a little longer to cook when they're frozen, but uh, just uh, take your time and cook them and, and that's the way to go for Thanksgiving, Christmas, and New Year's. So don't forget about Georgia blueberries next time you go to the store. You will not only help the health of your family, but help a large number of Georgia farmers. I've got a lot invested in blueberries, and, uh, and uh, we're in the blueberry business, and, and we, a lot of other folks are too, so we uh, hope, hope the folks eat blueberries because we sure like growing them. In Bacon County, I'm Mark Wildman for the Georgia Farm Monitor. Mark, thank you very much. And if you're a fan of blueberries like us, you definitely want to check out next week's edition of the Georgia Farm Monitor. Ray Delisio and Marsha head to the kitchen and we'll be cooking up all kinds of incredible recipes using blueberries. 
Meals from the Field again. That's next week right here on the Georgia Farm Monitor. Here's some good news for egg consumers. Published reports say that America's egg crisis is now a thing of the past. This comes nearly a year after the biggest bird flu outbreak ever. It forced some farmers to destroy their flocks. Reportedly, the laying hen population has rebounded faster than expected. And while supplies are slowly returning to normal, wholesale prices are near a five-year low. According to a government report, production of table eggs, which accounts for about 80% of supply, reached 613 million dozen in March, up 5.4% from December, and the biggest increase to start a year since at least 1994. Speaking of egg producing animals, an assisted living facility has found yet another way to help provide comfort to its residents. The Renaissance Marquise Retirement Village in Rome, Georgia, recently added two pet chickens, a hen and a rooster to their already impressive courtyard. The courtyard features a garden, hydroponic tower, and other types of agricultural settings. Life Enrichment Coordinator David Duke tells the Rome News Tribune that many of the residents grew up raising chickens. He also said Harbor Life specifically wanted a rooster so it would spark the memory of waking up to a rooster crow. Each and every year, the Georgia Farm Bureau sponsors a quality hay competition, which is designed to recognize excellence in production. A winner not only gets plenty of bragging rights, but also a very useful prize. A monitor's Damon Jones spotlights this year's winner, Paul Kelly from Monticello. As the old saying goes, you are what you eat. That's why it's so important for hay producers around the state to provide the highest quality product to keep the cattle industry thriving in Georgia. And no one did it better this year than Monticello's Paul Kelly, who won the annual Georgia Farm Bureau Quality Hay Contest. It was a great contest, and I'm just lucky enough to be the winner. But it's, uh, we're in the cattle cow-calf business. Uh, we raise Bermuda hay. Um, so, but this is, uh, this is the actual field. We're cleaning it off now. This is the actual field that the hay came off of. Uh, but we, we, feed, we do not sell hay. We feed all our, our hay, and so, but we join, we uh, do the contest each year. As for his secret to success, Kelly says it takes the right timing and, of course, a little bit of luck. Timing's everything, and if the weather. I mean, I was just lucky to have the weather at the right time with the fertilizer at the right time. Of course, we'd already done our soil sampling and, and put out the nutrients that we had to have. And then, of course, uh, you know, I was just blessed with rain, and when I got the rain at the right time, and cutting it, cutting the hay at the right time. If you don't cut the hay at the right time, it's, you know, you got to cut it at the right maturity or you won't have it. For the 19th year, Vermeer has partnered with the Georgia Farm Bureau to put on this annual contest. It's a competition they believe helps producers really focus in on their quality. I feel it's important because a lot of people out here are raising a good crop, but they're not cutting it at the optimal time. And, and I'd like to bring the focus into the difference between a crop that's cut at optimal time and one that's cut too late and how much more feed value that we can bring to our animals if we cut it at the proper time. And to the victor goes the spoils, as Vermeer provides the use of one of their most advanced mowers to the winner for a full year. Today we brought the TM1200. The TM1200 cuts 15 and a half foot wide. It has two parallel bars, so it flexes very good. It has a better flex than even, say, an eight foot three point mower. So you can take it up and over terraces in low spots in the field. It's very flexible as far as the terrain that you can take it on. Yeah, it's, that's an amazing machine. I've just never been anything like that on this place, that's for sure. In fact, as soon as y'all head out, I'm headed in the field and we, I'm gonna cut all weekend with it. I sure am, I'm tickled to death. It is an awesome machine that uh, Vermeer's put out there. Speaking of awesome, Setzer has gotten to see some of the best hay operations around the state while handing out the grand prize, and there are a few things all of them have in common. But when I start looking at these operators that are doing this, they've all got nice, clean operations. They take pride in what their place looks like, as well as the pride that they take in the quality of product that they turn out. While there can be only one winner, each participant gets something out of this contest as they get to see how their hay stacks up to others around the state. You know the quality of your hay. I mean, you got to know what your what your hay is, what you're dealing with, what you're feeding the cows. If it's lower quality, of course, I have to supplement my cows. Right. Well, this the quality hay I sent in to the Farm Bureau that won this contest. You don't have to supplement a cow. Reporting from Monticello, I'm Damon Jones for the Georgia Farm Monitor. Well, as if the SEC wasn't competitive enough, when we come back, we'll show you how UGA interns on Capitol Hill are living a quality life thanks to Delta Airlines, a one-of-a-kind facility for an SEC school. That's next. Stay tuned.
key message I would say to other farmers about making soil health a priority is the fact that you, you can reduce your inputs, you can improve your yields, you can withstand some more adverse weather conditions if your soil health is improved. They tell me if you add 1% organic matter, you can hold up to 27,000 gallons more water per acre with 1%. So a year when you have a drought, that could get you through. Healthy soil is basically, if you think of a soil aggregate as being like a house, that's often a really good analogy. Because when you're talking to a farmer, talking to a public audience, they can relate to a house. You know, we know that what's important about a house is that it has rooms. We don't need a pile of bricks. We need it to be well structured so that we can live inside of that house. Now, for our soil, it's very similar. You know, we, we have an aggregate. The most important thing of that aggregate is those, those pores, those empty spaces that really aren't actually empty. They contain air, they contain water, and most importantly, those empty spaces that aren't really empty are, are the living space of microorganisms. It's where roots grow. It's where everything dynamic happens in the soil. And those forces, those, those biological activities are much of what drives the healthy functioning of a soil. So what's unique about the Cornell Soil Health Assessment is that it looks at each biological indicator, each physical indicator, and communicates to the producer, this is what this indicator means. So for example, you have low aggregate stability. Basically, your house is falling apart. And so what does that mean? How do you manage for that? Well, if you have low aggregate stability, you need to build that house back up. You need to build those aggregates back up. And here are a handful of management techniques that can help you with that, you know, whether it's adding fresh manure, whether it's adding uh, cover crops to your rotation, whether it's adding perennial crops. You know, there are various ways to figure out how to make that work on your farm. We're still very much in a rapid growth phase in terms of doing the soil health as assessment. We currently um, get about 2,000 samples per year that are being submitted to our lab, and uh, that has been uh, steadily growing as there's more interest in the assessment framework and, and the test. In 2015, the University of Georgia received a sizable commitment from a major corporate sponsor to support a new facility in Washington, D.C. It's the only housing like it among SEC schools. We found out recently what the grant helped accomplish and one of the many students that it benefits. UGA has named the university's new residential facility on Massachusetts Avenue in the shadows of Capitol Hill, Delta Hall. The naming honors the $5 million grant from the Delta Airlines Foundation. It included extensive renovations of the 20,000 square foot facility. The office of Andrew Deal, director of the Federal Relations Office of Government Relations for UGA, is in the newly refurbished building. Delta Airlines obviously gave the majority of the funds for the house and the cost to, to set all this up. And I think Delta saw an opportunity not only to invest in the future of students from our state in Georgia, but also to build a name in Washington, D.C., right here in the heart of Capitol Hill. We're three blocks from Union Station, and what a great way to promote a hometown Georgia company with this project. The facility, purchased in 2013 by the UGA Foundation, provides living quarters, classrooms, and study space for faculty and students from UGA. One of the students benefiting from Delta's foundation is Franklin, Georgia's Gracie Rowe, a young woman proud of her Georgia 4-H roots. She's working in Senator Johnny Isaacson's office through the Washington Semester Intern Program. The Washington Semester Program, which is housed in Delta Hall, started in 2008, and it's the first um, UGA program that combines internship coursework and uh, residential life in D.C. And so it's, it's overwhelming at times, but it's one of the best experiences I've ever had. So I live with 31 of my closest friends and work and take classes in D.C. And so we really wanted a location that was in the heart of D.C. There's a lot of places we could have gone. But Capitol Hill just felt right. It's kind of served all of our purposes. But for the students, it put them right in the mix of the federal government and the ability to walk to work and be part of that. 
And one of our foundation trustee board members is actually the one who contacted with our president, Delta Airlines, and, and kind of offered up some levels of what we were doing and shared the vision and the mission of what we were trying to accomplish. In a recent article in the university's newspaper, Delta's vice president of community affairs, Tad Hutchison, said, Through the new facility in Washington, D.C., we aim to increase exposure for UGA and create a place where students can prosper. It's, it's wonderful to know that even though you're in a strange new city and you're at a job that you're not really sure about, especially for the first couple of weeks, it's great to have a support system of 30 people that are in the exact same position. And but she's a student who came in who said, I'm passionate about agriculture. She's never changed that. She's never veered from that lane. She's brought that into her role in communications in Senator Isaacson's office. And to me, and that is such a unique experience. I've been given so many opportunities, met so many people. Most of the people I hold dearest in my life and most of the experiences I reflect upon that have been the most positive and impactful to me are all because of 4-H. If you're a UGA student and would like more information about the Delta House or internship possibilities in Washington, log on to the address you see there at the bottom of your screen. That is gfb.org forward slash Delta House. The American Farm Bureau is supporting a trade deal between the European Union and the United States. Its official name, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, but better known as TTIP. In fact, AFBF was in attendance for the recent negotiation stakeholder session in New York City. American Farm Bureau economist Veronica Nye says the current deal being negotiated is vital to agriculture. Trade agreements are, are merely a way where we try to lower those barriers so that the U.S can sell more of our products, which increases employment and uh, helps ensure that we have longevity over, over the long haul. For growers, we always think about reaching more customers, lowering barriers, make us more competitive, which increases demand and increases the prices that we'll receive for our goods. Uh, for consumers, it gives consumers a, a much wider variety of products to choose from. Nye went on to say that while the current administration, as well as Farm Bureau, hopes to come to an agreement soon, Farm Bureau remains focused on finding the best deal possible for members and the entire agricultural industry. Time for our final break. When we come back, Ranger Nick checks in with his monthly segment. He wants to know if your property is inviting for deer, and if not, he's got some tips and suggestions on how to make it deer friendly. That's when the Georgia Farm Monitor continues. Well, finally today, deer season is still a few months off, but for the folks at QDMA, that's the Quality Deer Management Association, it's a year-round job. Recently, the Monitor's Ranger Nick spent the day at their corporate headquarters and walked away having learned what they do and how they can help you attract more deer to your property. All right, so let's say you're a landowner, you're a hunter, you're interested in managing for quality deer and the folks at QDMA or the folks you want to talk to, you're interested to know whether or not you've got enough good quality deer or maybe you don't have enough. How can I get more out there? Oh dear, what am I going to do? Well, I'll tell you what you're going to do. You're going to reach out to somebody like Lindsay Thomas, Director of Communications for the Quality Deer Management Association right outside of Athens, Georgia, National Headquarters. Lindsay, tell me something. Let's say I'm a hunter. I'm interested to know about the habitat quality of where I'm at. What are some things that an agency like yours could do to help me determine how great my land is or is not for deer? Well, Nick, we can help you understand wherever it is that you hunt, the requirements that those deer have in that region or that state or in that habitat from a food, water, and cover standpoint. And it's as simple as taking a walk on your property or hunting land, wherever you have hunting access, looking at the plants, the environment that's there, understanding what deer are the plants they prefer to eat during certain seasons, looking at the abundance of those plants and looking at the pressure on those plants, looking at what deer are eating and how much of it are they eating. Have they stripped everything from as high as they can reach to the ground? You probably have a, a deer abundance or deer a lack of deer food in that area at that time of year. So you want to try to get to a point where you've produced the plants deer want to eat in plenty of abundance and they're not eating everything they can find. And maybe somebody that can help me with that might be a consulting forester that I have come out to my land, take a look at the age of the timber there, tell me that maybe the timber I've got is far too old. There are some things that maybe I should do to disturb that land, to get some of that lush, yummy green stuff to come back that those white-tailed deer love to eat. What are some things that we could do to disturb the land to create some of that great food for those deer to eat? 
Nick, anything that puts more sunlight on the ground. You know, as you and I have talked about, deer live in a zone that's from your neck to the ground. And if there's no food for them to eat in that zone, you need to put some sunlight on the ground to grow it. Yeah. And that might be a timber thinning. Coming in, having a commercial uh, a logger harvest some of those trees commercially, you make a little money, put some sunlight on the ground, now you're producing more forage. It might be a clear cut. It might be simply letting a farm field or a small corner or edge of a farm field go fallow and produce from the natural seed bank the forbs and grasses that grow there to produce cover and forage for deer. So putting sunlight on the ground and then using techniques like fire or additional timber harvest to keep that succession from advancing, to keep those areas or at least some areas on your property in early successional stages where they're producing a lot of that deer cover and forage. That's interesting. We're going to talk next about ways that I can monitor potential deer movement on the property to determine if I need to do those kinds of things. So a little detective work out here. Lindsay talked about from the neck down, looking at brows and what deer want to eat. Lindsay, we're looking at some wild honeysuckle here, ice cream for the deer out there. I find that the wild honeysuckle is right here, but below my neck it disappears. What would you say about that? I'd say that's a pretty good sign that at some point in the year, maybe all year long, you don't have enough adequate forage out here for the density of deer you've got on the land. They're clearly stripping this honeysuckle from as high as they can reach to the ground. You got plenty of honey suckle up here, but you don't have any down here. Interesting. So one thing I can do is look at the browse intensity that the deer are taking. Let's talk about some other things I can do on my property. So another thing that you can do, and this is very, very high tech, is simply put a cage out on your property, some simple fencing wire, put a stake in it, about 10 feet of wire in a circle. Lindsay told us to put this into some clover, something that the deer love to feed on, and basically take that food away from them. Take that clover away from them, and Lindsay, what am I going to do once I put this in? What am I looking for in terms of a comparison from inside and outside? You're looking to see how much pressure is on the, the food plot out here that you've planted versus inside the cage where it's been protected. And that gives you some idea of your density of deer and the amount of food out there, the relationship between the two. If this outside the cage is gnawed to the dirt and inside it's lush and green, you've got a problem. You don't have enough food for the deer in that season. So you really need to adjust that. It's just detective work. And the way to determine for sure if there's stuff going on out there and if the deer in fact eating it or what is eating it, is to get yourself a wildlife camera. Maybe it's the neighborhood kid out there and all on some of that grass, but get that camera out there to determine really what's going on. Another piece of evidence to inform a great decision in terms of white-tailed deer management. Well, I tell you, I have become so fond of all the great work that the folks at QDMA have done, and I can't thank Lindsay enough for spending some time with me talking about how to increase more deer and how to thin out some of those deer in a very ethical way. It's been a great time. If you want more information about becoming a member of QDMA, Go online, check out QDMA.com, and you can learn all about the things that they're doing. While you're online, of course, slide on over to the Georgia Farm Monitor Facebook page and like that. And while you're there, like I always say, check out the Ranger Nick Facebook page, and we can become friends and keep in touch that way. Until next time, for the Farm Monitor, I'm Ranger Nick reminding you that enthusiasm is contagious. So pass it on. Y'all, thanks so much for watching, and we'll look forward to seeing you right back here again next month. See ya. Nick and Lindsay, thank you. Great job. Now that'll do it for this week's edition of the Georgia Farm Monitor. Just a reminder for all the latest ag info regarding food, great recipes, what's happening down on the farm. Be sure and check out our Twitter, Facebook, and Pinterest pages. You'll stay informed and see what's up in the world of farming and the Farm Monitor show. Take care. We'll see you next week right here on the Georgia Farm Monitor. Hope you have a great week.